Rochelle, welcome to Constitutional Chats. Please share with us a few opening comments about your experience attending local and state town halls and meetings and why you think it's important. Hi, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity, Kathy and Janine, and hi to all the winners that I see here on this lovely panel. It's definitely grown since we've known each other, as Kathy mentioned, since day one. Um, so I've been involved in just civic activities probably before I met Constituting America and still since. And um, honestly, since uh, the COVID lockdowns, it became really super important to start to engage with all of our elected leaders from the city, the town, the state, and, and the Congress. Um, so I kind of got involved and it's really important that we hear their voice, but we really think they need to hear our voice since the constitution's written at the consent of the governed. So we found it very important that we really get our voice out there. And I, along with a lot of people in my county um, have been doing that pretty, pretty boisterously in the past few years. Well, thank you, Rochelle. It's just, it's so great to have you with us today. And I know we've got a lot of questions lined up from our panel. So Janine, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Hi, Rochelle. It's wonderful to see you. For those of you that are listening, Rochelle, um, gosh, we, we met in Philadelphia and, uh, and Rochelle helped us with a few of our first winners trips to Philadelphia. And we, we just, you've just been a great advocate for the United States constitution in a supporter of Constitution America. And we thank you so much. And, you know, I, I really love this segment about the town hall because I think that it it's 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 the genius. Alexander Hamilton talked about the genius of the people in in the Federalist Papers. And so he talks about uh, so so this really represents the genius of the people, it's the people coming together. And I also, you know, our Constitution says, uh, you know, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness among these. And the First Amendment talks about expands on that and talks about uh, religion, assembly, press, petition, speech. And assembly is so incredibly important. So let's break it down for those who, and I think town halls are becoming a thing of the past where, where people are saying, oh, you know, we're just going to do it on social media or Zoom and people, how important it is. So my first question to you is how you've done so many of these town meetings and there, there are town meetings where, where just the people get together with no representative. And then there are town meetings where you might have a, a, a rep from D.C. or you might have a, a rep from the state government or you might have the mayor. It may be a school board. But there are also those organic ones that start with just the people getting together to talk. My first question to you is talk to us about the difference. And this this is this is, you know, these podcasts are are, are recorded and put out there for eternity and legacy. And, and the times are only going to get more, I think, um, uh, isolating, really. But talk to us about how important, so talk to us about how important it is for people to actually get together, whether you agree with each other or not. There's Everyone's concerned about the community. You're coming together from different walks of life and different perspectives, but just the unity of seeing people, you know, in the olden days, it used to be in the taverns, you know, but just getting together, uh, it could have been in a local town hall as well. Talk about the importance of just the, the camaraderie, the sense of community, the sense of uh, correspondence in person. Well, uh, being in person is like super important for me. Um, oh my God. Too much of this stuff goes, uh, you know, on Zooms, what nothing, you know, bad about this meeting right here, but it helps us to exercise our rights as an American citizen, right? We want to talk about what matters to me. And honestly, I think if we meet more in person, we find that we have more in common than we actually have separate. I just believe that there's like some forces out there that want to constantly put that division between us, but once you guys get face to face, you know, the, the differences start to dissolve and you see the commonalities and you kind of go and we dislike things because why? So that's what's one of the main things I like. And that whole getting together under the Liberty Tree, if you want to call it that, because that's kind of where it started with Sam Adams and all they would meet out there and, you know, maybe give the news of the day. But then they gathered and they talked even further. And, you know, likewise, we kind of still do that. Um, you know, we find it important to either meet in each other's homes. I mean, like I run a monthly meeting, educating people on the constitution in my home. And, you know, it's been wonderful because everybody really gets an opportunity to have, you know, discourse. And if we're looking to go talk to a state rep, you know, we run things by each other, um, after learning and, and have that discussion. If someone's nervous about talking out, 
um, in front of somebody in public, um, you know, we run that by each other and we make everybody feel comfortable. And I think the more educated we get, the better we are at just a, knowing our rights and being able to talk to others and bring them into the fold too. And when we, when we meet in person, there's, there's a sense of, um, social grace mm -hmm. that's lacking on social media, wouldn't you say? <laughs> and, and I, and I think that, that with, and also you sort of have to walk through the entirety mm -hmm. of a conversation. You, you just can't say something on social media and then dash off, you know, and right. leave the conversation. Sure. You, you sort of have to stay and finish the conversation. Um, but, but that it, it's so it's, it's, it's organic. It, it goes back to the beginnings of this whole philosophy of, of a people looking out for a people wanting the best for what's best for the, the community. And then you, you, we create a government so that they will help the community stay together. But um, I'm really fascinated with, with the genesis of it. So, so tell us about the different sort of places you, you say that you've met in your uh, just, or just basic you, you've met in your home and where else? So I run a Right. I run events monthly at local establishments too. So we try to bring some of what we're doing out into the public and we, we run events out and, you know, support the local businesses as well. And again, just try to get the education pieces out there, but we do our monthly, um, you know, school board meetings, a lot of us. And again, there's different topics in each of the different school boards, but for the most part, we're just still trying to attack, you know, some of the main uh, important issues. And again, we discuss those things. Um, so those are interesting if you're going to like go to a formal organized kind of a meetup and try to meet with your elected people. And, uh, we've done the local city councils. <laughs> I've been, you know, try to grab some people and come with me, go sit with the state rep that's in our local area, as well as do some of the county commissioner meetings. Um, our, but our, where, where are you doing, where are you doing these? Well, those meetings? are usually I guess held. Yeah, those are usually held more formally in um, the actual buildings where they're located. So school board's going to be in where their school administration building is. I'm trying to find my cord because I'm looking like I'm getting low on battery. Um, mm. And uh, and then the county, obviously the county commissioner people, they they have their city halls and their town hall, you know, meetings. Um, but when I'm doing my local events, like I said, we're in restaurants, we're in diners, Um a lot of them have like a separate room if they, you know, need to or whatever, but that's kind of the places that we've been picking so far. I mean, we haven't really found, I've tried libraries, but sometimes our, our hours conflict because it's funny. Once you start doing a meeting with people, they'd like to hang out. And after the top, you know, after the topic is discussed, um, again, people are, are like you're saying that organic conversation, having it with people and that's why being at my home is nice once a month because they can hang out as long as they need to and feel comfortable, you know? Um, so when we're like in a place of business, we kind of have a limited time frame. We've been in church halls. That was a really great experience. Um, I ran a full six, well, the constitution program I teach is uh, in six parts. And so we do two parts a night and um, a church hall that was huge that they opened up their basement to us and we got a lot of members from the church who wanted to just come out and learn the basic constitution so that was fun that was a lot of fun but i like being in the more relaxed setting because people like you said they want to talk and you know someone might be afraid to talk in a bigger group so you give them that opportunity to share out because they have something important to say and that's why they came out in the first place right <laughs> and we're, we're so lucky in this country that we have we have the the uh right to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, as when we speak with the students, we talk about the fact that, that there, there are a lot of countries and a lot of people in these countries, there are billion people in China alone that don't have the freedoms to petition the government or to talk, you sure. know, to, to even have these assemblies. So we have to realize how precious they really are that we can still do them. Um, and then parcel that out to like a speech or a, uh, a, a petition or, you know, whatever it may be it involved the press. It really, I think these town halls encompass everything in our first amendment um, wraps as we like to say. Um, and that's why it, it, and, you know, I think that I've noticed, I don't know if y'all have noticed, but I've noticed that I was, people don't go out anymore much. Remember, remember nightlife? <laughs> Rochelle, Rochelle, Kathy and I remember nightlife. I don't know. Jewel and Jorn. I mean, it's, it's like nightlife. 
there used to be a nightlife. There used to be a nightlife in New York City, um, a nightlife in Paris, and a night a nightlife in and even the area. And then people just don't go out anymore. And now at night is just kind of quiet. And uh, we all would you know sit at home and we we sit in our very closely structured. Uh oh, <laughs> it's falling apart here. Janine, we can't hear you. Okay, thank you. So we we I even I fall into that trap where where oh it's just so much nicer to sit here in my PJs. Was, but then once I get out, and I think that's what happens with the you know as you say, everyone wants to stay after and continue to talk. You you think oh the, yeah this is actually kind of nice. <laughs> this is actually kind of fun. Mm -hmm. So um well that's just good to hear. And I think I don't know what my timing is where we are. I always get so confused about how long I've talked and. I think um, I think I'm going to pass because um, we have another guest coming in. So I'm going to go ahead and toss. But thank you so much, Rochelle, for for all that you do as a oh, great thank American. You. Thank you. Same mm -hmm. to you. Keep striving. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you uh, so much, Jean, and thank you yourself for being here. Um, I was curious about as for you as somebody who's attended a lot of town halls and has been very active. What do you think makes a good town hall? Like what, what environments at a town hall do you feel like are conducive um, to good conversation and, and a productive environment? Um, and if there's like politicians or government officials out there or any parties who are looking to put on town halls, um, what do you think they could do to, to make it better? So meet in person. So right now my local uh, U.S. congressman doesn't really host them in person. He does them mostly by phone. And I think a good town hall would be A, in person, and then B, be open to allowing everyone to speak. Um, what we found over the past four years is that if we have questions, that they, they pretty much don't get answered. <laughs> they get screened. And it would be nice if, you know, that wasn't the case. I mean, it even happens in our local commissioner meetings as well, too. Um, and I would like, it's funny, I think the school boards run it really well, to be honest with you, if I look at like a formal town hall, right? They have a stoic face, no matter what you say or what you get up and do in your two to three minute conversation. I think they handle themselves well. I don't see the other elected officials when we're out there and we say something that may not be to their liking or it's something they're not wanting to address. They literally mock us. And that's been kind of, you know, a non-productive, you know, it just sends us away a little more angry. And you want to talk about a grassroots organized uh, meetup out in the parking lot. It happens organically that way too. So, and then other people probably parking are like, uh oh, what's going on over there? Um, but yeah, that that's kind of what I would think would make a really good town hall. Um, I can't say that that's true across the board, but those have been some of my experiences. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and then I'm curious if, you know, people on today's call are inspired to try to go to more town halls. Where do you find information about town halls? Um, what, what do you do to prepare for town halls? Um, kind of what, what's your how-to guide? So the how-to guide, I think for most of them, especially the formal ones, is to um, find the agenda, right? Know the date and time and meeting place of where you're going and get the agenda. They're usually posted, I would say, roughly a week for sure before the actual town hall meeting. So if it's really formally structured, you're going to have two opportunities to speak. And the first time you get to speak is usually based on an agenda item. That's why I say get the agenda, right? Um, and then if you have something that you want to you know, say, so for instance, if they want to do zoning in a location that you've you know, feel as a, you know, natural park and it shouldn't be impinged, you know, infringed upon, you know, you might want to come in and have proof why this is not a good area and blah, stuff like that. So have your research done. So have a prepared statement because you're only going to also get two minutes. That's the other part to this. So practice, right? Whatever you want to get up and do, you're going to really need to know what you want to say, practice what you want to say. Um, and then you got to get there early enough to get yourself scheduled because they will give you just a short little window to get yourself on the list, you know, so to speak. Now, if you're fortunate to have the two opportunities to talk, a lot of times the group will let you do an agenda item in the beginning. And then at the end, there's sort of like an open forum. 
Um, and that may be again timed. I, for the most part, they limit you to like two to three minutes. And again, if you know a hundred people show up and you add that two to three minute time frame up, you know some school board meetings I've seen in our county have gone to almost 11, 12 o'clock at night, and that that's a lot because we're all working people. So I think they want to just respect everybody's time. So just know what you want to say, be prepared, and um, practice. So I would definitely say practice. That uh, that always helps you. you it's a pressure to to speak in front. So that that makes sense. Um, I'm curious what. What types of people uh, go tend to go to town halls? Is it mostly individuals speaking for themselves? Is it often, more often like organized groups that will send a, a contingency of people? Um, what have you found? I think it's a combination of both. Um, I, I know one gentleman, I just happened to meet him in you know my constitution class you know series of things that I've been doing. And he's been going to town halls for forever. And he just, you know, he looks at, he feels it's important just to always know what the agenda is about. If there's something that he's in agreement with or disagreement with, you know, because it's not always going to a town hall to disagree. You might want to go and thank them for something that they probably just recently did. Um, like I was, I was thrilled to learn a really neat thing that that we do in our county to help clean out the lakes and ponds. And I had no idea that there was this invasive weed that was growing. And when they said, you know, they love people, either you bring your own. Um, kayak or they'll have kayaks and you just go out like for the day and just help them get rid of this indigenous weed and that that to me was just like the coolest thing to learn so like you know he just likes to go sometimes to do that and you know he's a very prayerful man he's a you know a godly man and so he likes to end his three minute time frame with something to pray over the county and the commissioners for because it's been, you know, it's it's a rough situation. So people go for a variety of reasons. Um, we're recently gonna help out a farmer here in, um, it, we're, a lot of people are going on Thursday to um, meet up and support a farmer who's being attacked by our Department of Agriculture. So, you know, it could be like something like that. And they're meeting beforehand to know what they're gonna do when they get out there. But that that happens this particular Thursday. So it's a variety of different things that you can get, whether it's organized or not. Uh, that's very cool. Um, I know at Constituting America, we always talk about, you know, we always try to teach people how to use the different First Amendment rights um, to rally people together around an interest. So uh, mm -hmm. that's thank you for talking about how, how town halls you know, can play a role in that. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was an interesting point, kind of as an aside, how you mentioned that town halls aren't always like people complaining, which I think can sometimes be a perception. That was interesting. You mentioning that sometimes, you know, you have to let politicians know what they're doing right. Uh, and I personally, in my life, found that that's actually helpful too. If there's something being done that actually is working, um, if nobody's like, it's kind of nature to only focus on the negatives. But if people don't call that out and say, hey, that was a good thing. We like this. We want more of this. Um, mm -hmm. they might not continue with it. So I, I really like that aspect. Yeah, um, definitely. I I wanted to kind of switch to a different track um, and talk about one of the most incredible central aspects of town halls is it's a really a, a space for people to engage with others who have maybe really different views. Um, and as opposed to kind of online social media when you don't really know the person, um, so it doesn't really matter what insults or, you know, anything you hurl at them. At the town hall, these are your community members. Um, so you just kind of have more stake in the game um, and things, you know, might might end up being more civil, I think. But um, I guess my question is, how do you ensure when you're in these town hall spaces that you're both able to stand up for what you believe in, but also hear out others? And if you just want to comment on the ability of town hall spaces to facilitate civil civic conversations. Uh, my experience, I could say that um, probably in my school boards, I've had that that happening more so where there's been the two different sides approaching. Um, I don't know. I think in in my township, I've had I haven't had the negative. I mean, they've gotten up and people giggle and snicker, but nobody's really belittled anybody. Um, at least there now, I can't say that's been true for some other parts of my county that have made national news. Um, how do you make sure, I mean, personally, I just approach it that I'm going in not to put, it's not an attack on a person, it's attack on a principle. And I think if people stick to that more so, um, but like you're just saying, and sort of like Janine even said earlier, it's like, you can go on like 
social media is say your nasty little thing and then you disappear into the woodwork, right? You might not even have your real name out there, but you can't do that when you're, you know, live and in person. Um, I mean, you go to these meetings, you have to give your name, you have to say where you live. Um, otherwise, you're really not getting a speaking piece um, because that's part of it too. Like, I think, you know, I've had a gentleman that came into one of my school board meetings and he wasn't a township member, but he owned a business. So he made his point to say, well, I think I have a position to say here because I own a business in this township. You know what I mean? So that that's another phase. But I think you need to attack with fact. You need to attack with principle and not attack the person. You know, even if you disagree with, you know, the elected people that are sitting in front of you making some bad decisions. Um, that's what I think helps to, you know, quell the, the thing. But I don't know that everybody goes in with that attitude. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. And I think that ties into a lot of the conversations we have at Constituting America about having civil civic conversations. And, and even if not everybody plays with the same, you know, holds themselves to the same standards, at least you can. And and hopefully that, that helps in the long run. I mean, um, it's, it's good to have an emotion behind it. Um, and I think I've grown in that area myself because I'll be honest with you, I was probably very emotional. I wear my heart on my sleeve. And I think I've grown in that area because I just think you need to just know what you're talking about. But if that person does, you know, show up, be empathetic because again, you know, maybe they don't have the same skill set you have. You know, you've been I've been doing it longer, and this person just really was upset or really emotional about something, and maybe just try to reach out. And we have done that in in a couple of my post school board uh, meetings. We tried, you know, the person would run out of the, and we really just tried. Hey, listen, nobody's attacking you. It was just an you know attack on on what we feel is wrong for kids and so forth, and. They still don't want to talk to you, but we try. You just try to be as human as possible because I think we lost that element during lockdown, to be honest with you. Yeah, I think that's true. As as you mentioned, it's even in a virtual format, it's it's easier to kind of not see people as as three dimensional, quite literally. Um, and and so it's easy to to not engage. Um, whereas when you're in a town hall, you you either physically walk away. Um, or you kind of have to be in that space and engage with people. So um, I've definitely found uh, what you say to have rung true. Um, that those are the really productive spaces. Um, but I, I guess for my last question, I was interested in, in what you were discussing about uh, actually the constitutional education programs you run in your community to educate fellow community members about the constitution um, and get them ready to go to town hall meetings. So I was curious if you could talk more about um, Obviously, at Constituting America, we're always interested in education, educating about the Constitution. So it's curious what your approach to that is um, in the you know, local programs you run. So I, um, I was doing a lot of this on my own prior to finding a group that actually has uh, really solid programs in, in the mix. And um, so pretty much, it's like I said, it's a six-part program. Um, I do it through the John Burke Society. They have everything already pre-recorded, but I do a lot of like local what's going on in our community to bring people up to date. So if like we're discussing, you know, the the seventeen enumerated powers, you know, because a lot of people are just like, well, we need we need the new amendments to do term limits. We need a balanced budget agreement. Well. If you actually teach the Constitution, you see in Article One, Section Eight, there's 17 enumerated powers. They've abused, you know, uh, Clause 18, the Elastic Clause, because if you look through the history, you know, they've stretched so many ways to say the General Welfare Clause is this and the Military Clauses are this, right? But once you teach the people, like there's these 17 enumerated powers, we could probably foresee a, a, a real budget, right? That's the one area that I definitely like to cover. And then when we get into term limits, that's Article 1, Section 2. Right there in the very first statement, it says that the elected representatives will have two years. So right off the bat, every congressman, every senator goes into office knowing you have a term, right? I think our problem has been finding really good uh, challengers if you don't like what's going on with the current representative representing your area. So these are the kinds of things I try to focus on. Um, there's been a lot of groups that are out there trying to do these amendments, and I try to educate people on why the Second Amendment needs to stay intact the way it is, and what I think a lot of people miss on that piece, and I teach this piece and I give evidence to it, is that, you know, a, a well-regulated militia is for the security of a free state. That's, that's the reason behind the Second Amendment, right? And people need to know the difference between what a militia is 
because people don't even know what that meaning is. It's been demonized a little bit. Um, they think it's the National Guard. And so I try to, my program encapsulates, you know, trying to dispel some of the myths and things that are out there. And this program happens to do it really well. And six parts works really well over three nights with two parts a night. And people have been really good about committing to that because it's tough to ask someone to do like almost three hours of a night. But like I said, and maybe just from this conversation, people want to get out and want to meet other people and have this conversation. So that's kind of what I've been doing. So it's a pretty organized program, but I try to bring in what's currently happening out there. Um, you know, like we're trying to stop carbon capture pipelines and, you know, people don't even have a clue like that the Department of Energy and the EPA, they're not even constitutional, you know, assigned agencies, right? So again, where in the constitution are they? And if they're not there, what can we do and stuff like that? So it's a lot of fun. I love doing what I do. It's It's been, education is my thing. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for your time. I'm now going to pass on to, to Jewel and Jordan for some more questions for you. Yes, thank you for what you do in our community. It's so important. And what Janine was saying about how people don't go out the same way, it is, we've seen the effects of that all over our culture. And this is definitely one of the important ways that we can heal that or rebuild that. Um, one big question I have first is, how would you tell our listeners some ways that maybe they can get some town halls started where they do not have them? And if they mm -hmm. need to talk to their representative, what do you what are some ways that they could get their representative to actually attend a town hall or host regular town halls with them? Well, that's that's a loaded question. Um, so I'm trying to think. I mean, I'm always looking, I'm a people person. So I'm always looking to talk to other people. So I don't know if they're in their churches, um, even the supermarket, you know, you kind of just go, hey, price of eggs was what two years ago? And what's the price of eggs this, you know, coming around here and maybe, I don't know, engaging in that conversation. Um, you know, I'm all about like reading labels nowadays and going, you know, huh, <laughs> these chemicals don't look, you know, fun. So I don't know, maybe in the grocery stores, I'm not really kind of sure how you want to like start it up. Cause like I said, I'm always talking to millions of people. Um, I mean, I guess you could probably try to even get on a radio station. Cause that's sort of how I found constituting America. <laughs> I'm listening to a radio station one day and there's Janine advertising this amazing scholarship program. And, you know, my, my mother even heard her on another different channel and she calls me and says, Hey, I think somebody's speaking your language. Why don't you? And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I would just get it out there and maybe, you know, hopefully somebody's going to, you know, see it and want to do it. But I'm thinking churches, maybe uh, starting something up there, you know, other social gathering places um, we're getting back to, which is a good thing. Um, um, Fairs like winter, uh, fall fairs and spring fairs. I'm starting to notice that they're popping up a little bit more too. So, you know, even if a person would put out a table and just start engaging with people there, because that's what I do with my program is I bring it to some of these fairs and set up. And a lot of people will come up to me and want to challenge some things. So that could be another good way to do it. Now to get your state rep involved, um, that that's a tough one. I mean, you know. If they're in, if they're in the state house, and I mean, I guess you got to catch them when they're on their home turf. Maybe bring a couple people with you to their offices first, show them that it's not exactly confrontational, and then, um, I mean, just always do the invite. Whenever I'm doing a local education event, I invite them all, and I always hope that somebody's gonna, you know, pop in at some point in time. I did get a couple local council people to attend a couple meetings, but for the most part, I don't know. I don't know if they're a little gun, gun shy. I'm not 100% sure, but I just say, just keep always making the invitation and then sending a follow-up letter saying, well, you know, we missed you this time, but, or an email, you know, hopefully maybe you can join us on the next time around, but that's a tough one. That, that's tough. Those are great ideas though. And part of it is just, we got to get out of our shell and believe that the other, that if we tell enough people that we'll find those who feel the same way and we can be the reason that they come out of their shell. Sounds good. I'm going to jump ahead to during the town hall. Uh, obviously, uh, things like this, you would love to have all different types of people come and you can have a good conversation. 
Uh, now, everything's not always perfect. Now, you can disagree, but it's nice to be able to talk. Now, what do you, what is your thoughts on when you have detractors or people and people that just don't really want to come to an agreement or have a civil conversation? They just want to spew what they're saying and saying what you say is wrong. Mm -hmm. um, what is your best ideas on dealing with that and then moving forward to the next town hall? That same person, not. Yeah, I, I still I still think it goes to like you have to have a little bit of, again, empathy toward the other person. Right. Um, hearing what they said, that would be extremely important because even maybe amidst some of the emotion that's in there, there's definitely some point that the person was trying to make and maybe focus on, you know, directing them to that point. But I just always try to bring it back to what I know as either fact or, and again, try to avoid, you know, making it personal, right? Um, if they're making it personal, I mean, sometimes you're just going to have to walk away and and not really engage. I'm sure you're going to come upon them again. Um, I had a I had an interesting situation. It wasn't really necessarily a town hall, but it was at a fair. And a gentleman came up and he didn't like one of the posters that was up. And we just got into conversation. And when our conversation was done, he even he even said to me, I guess we do have a lot more in common when we, than we thought. And I said, exactly. You know, it's like judging a book by its cover. Just because I have this poster here does not mean that I don't, you know, empathize with what you're doing or even actually pointing out that the U.S. Constitution protects all rights. It's not just my rights versus yours. So you're misreading maybe what I have up here. And he honestly left. And when I saw him as I walked through just to see some of the other vendors that day, he actually poked the lady that he was with. And he said, that's the one I was telling you about. And and I just waved. I thought, OK, I hope that was friendly. <laughs> Didn't know, you know, um, and, and he was cool. He gave me the thumbs up and I was just like, OK, cool. <laughs> so uh, that would be what I would do. I just try to stick with fact and just not, you know, take the personal out of it, you know. And just one more quick one that's similar. Um, and I know that, so our your object and our object with town halls would be a cultural, um, relational, and political. So when we're met with being ignored from the state reps or ignored from our school board or even mocked, what are some good ways to continue to work and not let that discourage us or turn that into political action? Well, I usually follow up if they didn't like something I basically said, because like I said, most of the time I try to, everything I do, I'm helping a person right now run for office. And everything I said to him was, we have to have everything backed by fact. And so I follow up with them fact, you know, if um, if they, you know, felt differently about it or whatever, uh, but there has to be a follow up because if you let it go, you might miss an opportunity, right? To actually change hearts and minds. So if it doesn't get, you know, like this time around, maybe the next time around, we hit it a little bit differently and stuff. But um, yeah, I, ew, you, you've got some tough questions, guys. <laughs> I guess I play it by ear. I, I, I really do. I, I play a lot of stuff by ear, but I just try to have a lot of stuff behind me before I make those decisions. And I pray before I do a lot of things too, because again, if it's not going to come out and be pleasing to his ears, it's not worth saying. Yeah, we're asking tough questions, but you're doing tough work. So I think that we're <laughs> just trying to um, turn that into hearing the motivation and understanding from from your perspective so that all of us can do that as well. Um, sure. And I think it's coming through loud and clear, really, to everyone who's listening and us as well. So thank you. And we're going to pass to Kathy. Great. Well, thank you, Jewel and Jorn and Tova and Janine for your great questions. And Rochelle, it's just so fun having you on our show here today. We want to give a shout out to some special people in the audience, starting with D'Angela Hines uh, with Emanuel Coast Christian Academy. So thank you, D'Angela, for being with us today. And we also want to give a special shout out to Rochelle's mother, Gloria Porto, who's on. Uh, Rochelle, I heard you mention your mom a second ago, and I see her there in the audience. So thank you, Mrs. Porto, for joining us. 
Uh, we also want to thank our Las Vegas listeners who tune in to Las Vegas's uh, KKVV at 1060 AM. This show airs Monday evenings at 6 PM Pacific in Las Vegas. So thank you to, to all our listeners at KKVV. So we are going to uh, be having uh, State Rep Stuckey join us in just a few minutes, but I wanna try to get in uh, at least uh, one audience question, one or two audience questions if we can. And uh, Julianne Smith asks, do you have rules, formal or informal, that you use when you host your meetings and discussing uh, possibly contentious topics? And if so, what are they? Hmm. Good question. Um, I mean, I guess I follow some of the principles that I have when I'm in my work environment, which is to, you know, be respectful, be open, um, you know, hear the person that that's out talking and again, attack the principle or the topic, not the person. That's like one of the workplace rules that I think is just good overall. What was the other parts of the question, Kath? Uh, when just do you have rules when you're holding uh, town halls or any sort of town meetings, uh, and especially when you're discussing contentious topics? Yeah, well, I think in like the formal town halls, you're following their rules. And for mm -hmm. the most part, I honestly think most people have definitely done that. Um, uh, again, you know, I just think it again, it, it's just being respectful and, you know, being we were given two ears and one mouth. So kind of following that principle, like when you're meeting with other people, no matter what you're doing, just, you know, hear, hear more than you actually speak. And sometimes that's hard for me, but I try. <laughs> well, that's great. And uh, Renee McSherry asks a question that may be a little hard to answer, but she asks, how often should town halls occur? And I know you mentioned that uh, your member of Congress uh, doesn't really hasn't had them since COVID. What do you think is the ideal uh, for elected officials, especially how often do you think they ought to be holding town halls? Uh, well, definitely when they're home and they're home a lot. That's one thing I know. Now, it doesn't have to be every time they're home, but if there was at least two to three a year, that would be awesome. And in person, you know, not just this phone call town hall. Um, cause again, I talked to a lot of my friends in, in my area, not everybody even gets that phone call. So we're kind of wondering like, how's that even screened out? Right. But if there's a general town hall and everybody can go, that would be even better. Um, I mean, two at the minimum, three at the most, that would be really good. Uh, was there a second part to that question too? No, no, I think okay. I got it. <laughs> Well, I'm going to, we'll do a few more audience questions if we have a few minutes, but I'm going to go ahead and take the uh, opportunity right now to, to introduce our next guest, Texas State Representative Lynn Stuckey. And I'm not sure Representative Stuckey has actually joined us yet, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, start his introduction so we can maximize our time with him when he does get on. Texas State Representative Dr. Lynn Stuckey serves as the Texas State House Representative for District 64 in the North Texas area, serving all of Wise County and the Northwest portion of Denton County. Dr. Stuckey holds a doctorate of veterinary medicine from Kansas State University. Shortly after graduating, Representative Stuckey headed to Texas to find a place to begin practicing veterinary medicine, where he's practiced for 40 years, which is so impressive. And Janine may want to talk a little bit about that, because I know she's had firsthand experience with, with Dr. Stuckey and his outstanding uh, veterinary uh, medical practice. Prior to being elected to the Texas State House, Dr. Stuckey served on the Sanger Texas Board of Trustees and was named Citizen of the Year by the Sanger Chamber of Commerce. Dr. Stuckey was elected to the Texas legislature in 2016 and serves as vice chair of the House Committee on County Affairs and serves on the Article II Appropriations Subcommittee, which focuses on healthcare funding. He's also a member of the Committee on Resolutions. Representative Stuckey and his wife, Lori, a former Denton ISD teacher and coach, are the proud parents of three grown children and first-time grandparents of Bo. So, uh, Lacey, do we have Dr. Stuckey? Or... If we're... He, he just came on. Oh, great. Well, Dr. Stuckey, we are so excited to have you uh, with us today on... Our Constitutional Chats podcast. We just read your introduction and um, are really excited to, to hear a little bit from you today on your perspective 
of why you think town halls are important and as an elected official, uh, what you have gotten out of uh, holding town halls in the past. And I just wanna say hi to Dr. Stuckey. Um, hello, Dr. Stuckey, how are you? Oh, and you're on mute, you. Dr. Stuckey. How's that? Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, how are you? Good, to, good to be here, good to see you. And I appreciate this opportunity. I'm sorry I missed the introduction or uh, uh, the uh, initial part about me because I'm not sure what you guys had to say, but I hope it was all good. Uh, and I'm blessed <laughs> to be representative of House District 64 for the last eight years. Um, I started as a veterinarian in the area and then gave back to the community in many ways, including uh, through our church and through uh, different organizations. And uh, felt like I could represent, but uh, the the importance of uh, town halls is that the question? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, we we've had another guest on that's uh, a dear friend of ours, Rochelle, who's been talking about the town hall from the perspective of you know the the American citizen, and we wanted to get your perspective. Um, and I just think you're so fabulous, and you're my veterinarian up here at the ranch, and they've done it. Amazing job, and you're just terrific representative for the state. But but we would like to hear from you. Wh why do you think the town hall is really important? And when you're there, what do you feel is your main objective when you meet with your constituents? Well, first of all, they call this job representative. And being a representative is that I should be having an open line of communication with the people I represent. And we have about 225,000 of those. The probably the best thing about town halls is to, to get rid of misinformation or uh, you know, there today uh, it's not uncommon for there to be complete lies with no truth in them at all. And it's an opportunity for constituents to be able to talk with their representative or their senator and actually ask them questions. And there's no better way to communicate than to sit down with other people and be able to look them in the eye and be able to speak because uh, you send out a lot of signals and you can tell a lot more on what a person is saying and whether you're going to believe it or not when you are in person. So, so true. Um, what, what do you find, how do you, um, how do you handle the crowd? I mean, if you have, um, when you have differing points of view or people are upset about something and they come together as a community to be in that town hall with you, um, how do you handle the, maybe a, a, a diversity of thought in the town halls? Well, the first, the first thing is you have to have people there that actually want to make the place, make your district better, make the state better. If they're only there in opposition to shout out and to disrupt, um, you literally have to remove those people. That's that's very rare. But uh, and if they uh, really want to sit down and talk with you, if they if you can't do it in that time space, and I always try to get with them in the future and sit down and discuss the issues that they may have. But uh, for the most part, you just make sure that everybody is civil. They're not uh, saying anything that would be. Something you wouldn't want your kids to hear because today people have a tendency just to say whatever, and many times it's uh, obscenities and things that we just can't have. I don't. We, we're losing respect more and more as time goes on. But again, when you look at biblically based values, of our as I as a lot of people call it the basic information before leaving Earth, the Bible, we see how there's a a swirling downward, and uh, we're seeing more of that, even in the last eight or 10 years of disrespect uh, for for individuals and disrespect for the process. Well, I, I think what I'm talking about, Dr. Stuckey, is, is more just diversity of thought on the opinion of the topic, right? So, um, because, look, I, our founding fathers were pretty rowdy themselves. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I do believe that everybody should be respectful, but but really my, my question is, how, how do you... How do you, how important is it when people go to the town hall? And I want to make sure everybody else has a chance to ask a question, but so this will be my last question. But when someone goes to a town hall, I would think one of the great things about a town hall would be able to hear diversity of opinion. Um, 
not just people who want to 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 say do it this way and we're so glad you're doing it this way but is it not interesting to hear from an, an alternative point of view the genius of america that maybe somebody has something and maybe it's a brand new topic of of something that we we work with the school students ab- about writing a petition and how they're the ones you know that also come up with the answers of how to fix a problem so talk to us just about the ingenuity of the american people and how important it is to hear you know, diversity of thought for you to then take with you. And then also maybe you hear it from the genius of the people that really it kind of comes from them and you're representing them to go take it to the state. Right. So talk about that a little bit. There's always be a better listener than a speaker because there's a lot of times good information comes from these constituents that you have in many of the bills that I passed and have filed uh, and passed came from constituents uh, in their thought process and they're not always the same as mine, and that's good. And that's why uh, together we are synergistically better than individually. So uh, we need to be listening to, to what they have to say, and we all need to be uh, allowing the dialogue and do it in a respectful manner. I like that. What did you just say? We're better together than individually? Is that what you just said? Uh, yes, we're better together. We call it synergism than we are individually. Uh, synergism meaning you know one plus one is not two one plus one is probably three because uh, we're working together do you have a one one i one thing that sticks out in your mind that you learned from a constituent in a town hall that you really thought was terrific uh, there's a lot of them a lot of things and uh, you know when it comes from uh Again, I'm a representative. I may be an expert as a veterinarian, but I'm not necessarily an expert in uh, how you uh, you are an actress or or how you uh, do a lot of other things. Banking, I, I don't. I'm not an expert in banking or real estate, and uh, it's important that we be good listeners because we're the representative. Uh, we never, if we we're, if we profess to know it all, we don't need to communicate with our constituents. That's not the case. We need to be discussing and uh, going through issues that we can make the place better, make the world better by getting other people's views. Well, you and George Washington, because George Washington was a great listener. So there you go, Dr. Stuckey. It's it's you and George, it's you and George Washington. Okay, I'm going to toss to Tova so she can ask you a question because I know we have limited time with you. Thank you so much, Dr. Stuckey. Thanks for coming on. We know you're so busy. There you go, Tova. Are you there? It's like, Tova's still... Right. I'm here. Hi. Um, thank you so much for, for being on with us. Um, we, we appreciate your time. I guess my, my main question uh, concerns what we were talking about a bit earlier, which is, uh, it seems to me that there is a, a difficulty in, in being representative and that you have to, uh, you obviously want to be at home in the home district as much as possible in order to be able to talk to constituents and hold town halls like that. But also as a representative, you have to spend time in the capital um, in order to work with other legislators and get work done. So, um, you know, as a, as a representative, how do you find the balance between being able to spend enough time at home so you actually know what to advocate for, but also um, dealing with the inherent trade-off of then maybe you have less time to work with people um, actually in the state Congress? That is a great question. And, that, and that's one one thing that I believe Texas is superior over most of the other states because we're only one of seven states that still has what I would call uh, citizen representation. We are to meet, uh, we just meet every two years. We meet uh, the second Tuesday of the January of the odd year, and then we go for 140 days. And then we can have special sessions like we did this last year, but that's only call, called by the governor. So we're theoretically only supposed to be in Austin about four months and the rest of the time living, working and raising our family amongst amongst our constituents. Because the more we're home and the more we're directly working with them, uh, whether we're looking at, at passing a new law like the Athena's alerts that I had because of the unfortunate, terrible uh, tragedy of where a seven-year-old girl was abducted by a courier when they were delivering her Christmas present and killed her mother uh, was very upset that they could not uh, do the Amber Alert immediately because she knew something was wrong. And so we together, working with uh, Caitlin, her mother, uh, developed the Athena's Law, which allows for an immediate release of an emergency 
signal within 100 miles of the abduction and to go out and it's based solely on that peace officer or police department, whether it's uh, in the city, it'd be the chief of police or in the county of the sheriff's department. But being amongst the people and uh, spending time at home, the more we can, the better. Unfortunately, this last year in 2023, we, we spent a record number of days in the Capitol where we were not at home and it makes it much more difficult for that to happen. But I think the more we spend in our district and the less in Austin, the better. Oh, thank you very much. If there's only five minutes left, I'll pass on, but I, I appreciate your time today. Well, thank you for a great question. Thank you for what you do as well, as we were talking to uh, Rochelle. Um, there are two sides of the coin here. Could you tell, we asked Rochelle this hard question as well. Um, can you tell us maybe from your perspective, what are some ways that we can talk to our representatives when we feel like they are not listening to their constituents and maybe some trigger words or something that we can, that we can try to pull them back in to listen? Um, the great question. Um, the first thing is that in our office, and I hope in everybody's office, is that when you call in to our office or you send us an email, uh, our staff is always collecting those emails and, and, and trying to answer any questions you may have. But we're always going to ask, A, are you a constituent? B, are, do you live in the state of Texas if you're not a constituent? And C, you know, where do you live if you don't uh, live in either one? So the most priority for us is our own constituents. And the more calls we get on a particular issue from our constituents, the higher the level of uh, you know that importance goes. When we have, when we're in in session and we're dealing with an issue that involves whether it's a social issue or an infrastructure issue, the more calls we get on that issue, the more important it is to us, and the more we need to be listening to our constituents because we represent you. So. I, does that answer the question you're asking? Calling, yes. Calling, if you, uh, in the case of, uh, if it's a veterinary issue, uh, a lot of times people will uh, call their constituent, and guess what? Those other state reps come to my desk and ask about the veterinary issue because they know I'm an expert there. When it comes to a legal issue, I may be talking to one of the lawyers, which is about two thirds of our house and about two thirds of the Senate. So. Uh, just letting people know your concerns and then them discussion, discussing the issue with the constituents and then other members who are experts makes a big difference. We can pass on now. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Jill and Jorn. And um, uh, Dr. Suckey, just in our limited time that we have left here, I wanted to share a comment from Paul Pierce, who says, when I was a county commissioner, I held night town halls in three locations in my district every other month. People work during the day when councils meet. Also, representatives forget they represent the people, not rule them. And I, I know that's not the case with you. Um, you've made that very clear. Um, but I, uh, Tracy asks... How do you alert uh, your constituents when you're going to have a town hall? If they're if they're interested in attending, um, how can they find out? Well, today email is by far the number one. We'll do Twitter, Facebook, email. Um, we hope that uh, we have the email of every one of our constituents, um, and that's probably the easiest way for them to be alerted, unless it's going to spam. Um, but uh, we'll we'll advertise it too if it's. Uh, I mean, sometimes it's uh, held at a school or a church, and they'll they'll help us with that. Uh, and then we'll we'll try to get it out in all the different media outlets that we can in advance to let them know. And of course, it's a lot harder to do those town halls when you're in the middle of issues and you're in Austin. And many days toward the end of the session, we'll we'll be there seven days a week. So the only town halls we get to do, and I've done a lot of these, is the Zoom, just like we're doing right here. Mm -hmm. uh, did that a lot with with uh, schools, uh, with uh, cities, um, where we meet on a regular basis, where we're we're just having a it's basically a town hall. They're wanting to know what's going on there, and they want to give input on what how they see things. And as these bills are maturing and coming to the floor, uh, unfortunately, many of them can have unintended consequences. So we need to be talking to them about those and make sure that we don't pass something that we later find out is 
actually been doing the exact opposite of what we wanted it to be. Well, that's great. And it sounds like that uh, it might be a good idea for anybody who's interested in attending town halls, no matter where they live, to sign up uh, for the email uh, list from their representative. And that's probably a good way they could get notified uh, when when their their elected officials are having town halls. So we're right at the top of the hour. We think you- I, I just want to say too, I just want to say too, uh, sorry, Kathy, to interrupt you. I think it's really cool to hear there are Zoom town halls. I don't think I really, if, if we talked about that earlier, I can- totally missed it but that's interesting uh go ahead i'm very much more popular since covid i mean if they mm -hmm. do that. Uh, and we see that happen a lot more and a, a last question i have for you uh, is do you ever have constituents you should, you know i think probably the town halls are called most of the time by but Rochelle, we had a lengthy discussion about how you can have your own town halls with a with your with your representative, without your representative, whatnot. But most of your town halls are probably initiated by you reaching out to help your constituents. Have you ever had constituents call you and say, "Would you please call a town hall on this?" H has that ever happened in, in an opposite where the where the people are actually asking one for one from you? Yes, we do, especially when it, an issue in particular is at the forefront. Whether we're talking. You know, it's a social issue or it's an infrastructure issue, and it's, it's, a, it's a big issue in that area. Uh, they'll ask for one, and we'll do one. I, I did one uh, in Argyle not too long ago that they asked for. Uh, and so, and I'm glad to do those. And, uh, you know, it helps a lot but when people can ask their questions and, and get uh, the short answer or the long answer. And, uh, and the other thing is that, that I, I still remember the first time I ran and there, you have 200 and some constituents, one, one individual was a constituent said, well, I don't like my current rep because I don't get enough time with her. And I said, well, remember, if we talk to every one of our constituents one time in the year, that's over 600 a day. So that's why town halls are so much more important or my staff being so much more important because we make an effort to, to respond, not in a canned letter, but in a, in a truthful way to each and every concern that our constituents have. But they have to understand that when you have that many, it is much easier when you do a town hall or you do things uh, in, multi in multipliers, not just one-on-one. -on -one. Who calls you for the town hall, like for that one particular, did a representative of, or did more than one person call you for that particular, then we have to go. But I mean, in that particular instance, who called you? Since it was the Catholic Church in Argyle that was asking about uh, school choice, and they wanted to they wanted to town hall. So a representative from from the from the school called you. So there you go. You can call your representative and ask for a town hall. There's another kind of great thing we learned today. The, um, so uh, sorry, Kathy, you just had to, you know, I it's so fun to talk to Dr. Stuckey like this. Um, and so Dr. Stuckey, thanks for coming. I appreciate Rochelle. You were amazing. And our wonderful panel and Lacey and Kathy. It's a great show today. And Dr. Stuckey, all the best. Thanks for coming. Anyway, I would love to. Uh, Anybody that's an animal lover is one step above, you know, so we you know how much you love your animals. I appreciate that. God bless you all. And thank you for allowing me to be part of it today. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.